All right, so today I have the absolute privilege of kicking off the Mod 3 project. Um, I had this sheet for questions, all good that there are no questions, um, but any like important notes that I go through while I'm speaking here, I will type the notes at the same time, just so you guys have something to refer to. Um, so Mod 3 project is basically, oh, let's see, congratulations first off, y'all are smart. Um, and all right, the project is to create a classification model. So over this mod, you guys have seen like, what, eight, nine different models. Um, and you're just gonna build a classification model using some data. And here you can either choose, um, I think there's four data sets provided here, or you can choose your own data set. Um, since we're kicking this off now, um, I think for the rest of the week, I guess if you have a data set in mind and James isn't back yet, feel free to Slack me and I'll let you know. There are some guidelines uh, for choosing a data set, so make sure you check those off first before you let me know. Um, but yeah, so you have a choice between the data sets provided here and if you have just a passion project that you want to work on, feel free to do that as well. But that has to get, um, what's the word? It has to get approved by an instructor. All right. So as I, as I mentioned, um, choosing the data. Um, there is Chicago car crash data. I think it's like how severe a car crash is. Um, Terry stop data, which is I think whether someone gets stopped or not stopped. Um, for this one, actually very, very relevant right now because there is some um, race and gender, basically demographic data being used. And this is actually a really good opportunity to take a look at uh, are there biases here or um, another thing to take note of is in your model. Um, I don't know if anyone has ever read the book Weapons of Math Destruction. Um, really cool book, really easy read, but um, basically it's talking about how, you know, if people just blindly train models, not thinking about the features that you're using and the coefficients you're using, you might be creating, you know, potentially um in this case it could be um a um i think there was a model once that came out saying that like race is actually a feature that was used in like deciding credit and that's not what we want and so just keeping in mind the features that you're using i think for this project would be a really sensitive but a good opportunity for sure um this is a custom customer churn data set um really just whether someone will um, do business or not do business, I think, binary classification. And finally, um, Tanzanian water data set. Um, it's an ongoing competition, so that'd be cool if your model happens to be really, really good. Um, yeah, it's a competition. So, um, and again, it's a ternary classification, which I think it means that there are three classes. I always forget. Yeah, three classes. All right, so that, those are the data sets that are being provided. Um, Next, there's data that's outside of the curated list. There are some um, constraints here. Um, it should be classification. I think the biggest issue here, so when I was working back on campus, um, all data sets had to be chosen on your own. And so one of the biggest things that I saw students um, not mess up with, but are confused about is what data sets are good for classification and what are good for regression. Um, a lot of people I saw were actually using regression data sets for classification. I mean, it can be done, but regression would just be a better, uh, a better project if you were using that data. So for example, I've seen projects where, um, I don't know, for some reason, Spotify API is on my mind, but let's say you want to predict how dancey a song will be. If anyone has ever seen the Spotify API, um, you can actually get this one metric from like zero to 10 on how danceable a song is. And I saw a project that was predicting danceability and this person basically split up into like zero to three is not danceable, like four to seven is like mildly danceable and then higher than that, super danceable. Um, that was used for a classification pro project, nothing wrong with that. But if you think about it, since you have that one to 10 metric, it would just be better to do a regression and just predict exact values. I mean, context does matter, but um, just make sure that your target variable is more of a category. Maybe you're predicting like genres of a song or yeah, something more categorical and less so, what's the word? I think ordinal is the word, but 
but yeah, just make sure it's categorical, not a continuous variable if you wanted to do your own data set. Um, yeah, um, let's see what's, what it says here. Classification project, um, complexity. Um, there are some data set constraints here. Um, and actually, let's just jump into that right now. Um, this is obvious, can't be one that we've already worked with. A minimum of a thousand rows. Um, I think a thousand rows is actually, yeah, that is the minimum. Uh, depending on your data set and how many classes you're looking at, I like to lean towards like at least seven to 800 data points per class. Unless you're dealing with a problem with a huge imbalance on purpose, um, that's like on average what I would recommend if you're doing a multi-class problem. Um, 10 predictor columns, just because you want to have a good amount of features and it has to be approved. Um, oh, by the way, I actually prefer it if you have any questions, just interrupt me at any time. Um, so if any of you, if you have questions, just do that. All right, here, don't pick a problem that's too complex. Um, basically just don't do NLP or computer vision just because we're gonna do that in Mod 4. Um, but yeah, I think that will be covered if you're doing a data set that isn't provided, that will be covered um, as you try and get approval for that. All right, and I guess part of that problem is like, where do you even start? If you really don't like the data sets that uh, were provided, where do you even start? Um, here, two ways that you can get started, problem first or data first. Um, I think problem first is the approach that you would take if you have, I don't know, if you have a specific field that you're really passionate about. If you really want to get into like healthcare or you really want to get into, I don't know, sports, um, that might be like a problem first um, approach where you would formulate your problem, all right, what do I want to classify? And then I'll look for data that helps me solve that problem. Or, um, I, which I, the second approach I think is a little easier, data first, um, just cause there are all these sites um, that have good data sets that have already been curated. Very likely these data sets for the most part actually have, I think a little less cleaning to be done if that sounds like a good thing to anyone, any one of you, but um, yeah, I know that the UCI ML data set repository, some of them are quite small, so look out for that. Kaggle, um, as you, I think y'all should know, um, a lot of great data sets. Um, I, I don't know, I didn't know about this resource. New York City Open Data Portal, a lot of good data there. Um, and Airbnb has like, if you ever wanted to classify, I don't know, Airbnb listings, they have a lot of data there. I think you can like filter by country or city or something like that. All right, deliverables, um, same as your last projects. Jupyter Notebook, README, blog post, presentation. All the same. Um, these are the same as your last project as well, so I won't go super in depth, but, um, and these are also in the rubric, I believe. Any questions about like what should be in your notebooks? All right, cool. Okay, this is the bulk of what I wanted to talk about, the process of this Mod 3 project. Um, this is, I guess, your second big, like, full data science project, a process project. Um, so I think it's, like, really good to get used to doing it in, like, I guess, the right way. Um, so first, let's start with business understanding. Even if you're using a provided data set, you should at least look into what your data set's about and what business good it does. Like what, why is your project important? Um, might not seem super important at first, but you'll realize when you're at a job interview and people ask you about your projects, you'll be like, oh right, yeah, I just classified, I actually um, had a student do this. I classified Pokemon. Um, whether they were legendary or not. And then an interviewer was like, why? <laughs> um, but anyways, I digress. Um, so do a little bit of research, just very surface level research on whatever it is you're doing. Come up with like, you know, maybe two to three points on like why your project is important and why it's needed. Um, data understanding. And this includes, I guess this and parts two and three include EDA. Um, I think for, yeah, for data understanding, for EDA, when you're doing a classification project, you can sort of cater your EDA 
for a classification project. So if you already know that your target variable has like three different outcomes, you kind of want to look at your variables in relation to those outcomes. Very similar to like in your regression project, you probably plotted a lot of scatter points, scatter plots with your, um, with everything against your uh, target variable, just to see the relationship between each thing. Um, very similarly, you could do something like that because that would be very telling what features um, would be good for classification. Um, for example, um, one very common one, if you have, let's say you're trying to predict if, if it's gonna, I don't know, I can't think of an example, if it's gonna rain or not. If it's gonna rain or not, let's say you have um, precipitation. Um, if you plot all the precipitation values for, um, Precipitation is rain, isn't it? All right, let's go with the different cloud cover. <laughs> let's do like cloud cover values. Um, if you plot like over overlapping histograms of like um, all the ones that won't rain and will rain, and if you see like an obvious difference in the two histograms, that's very telling that cloud cover is going to be a good predictor for uh, whether it will rain or not. That was kind of an awful example, but I hope you get the point. Um, I've seen a lot of projects that they actually plot one of these for almost every variable. And usually those kind of correlate with the most important features plots that come out of your, um, that come out of your, your output of your model. Um, so that would be a really good EDA and could be good hypotheses to form as well. Um, so I always like to say visualizations that compare features against different target outcomes. All right, uh, data preparation, uh, common problems in classification projects, um, doing dummy variables, one hot encoding, and also smoke. Um, there are definitely cases where you wanna try both. Um, and I'll get into that once we get to modeling, but just remember that those are things that you might have to do. Um, in modeling, um, very likely you're going to be running, like, I think in the rubric it says, let me see, I think it says to run three models. Let me see. Where is that modeling part here? Uh, multiple models. Okay, so I guess multiple means two or more. Uh, but you should be fitting at least three models. Um, very likely, since all the models kind of run the same way with like a dot fit and dot predict, um, you would end up running like, I don't know, maybe six or seven, just because they all have the same code, kind of. Because you're doing that over and over again, something that'd be really good is if you functionalize your modeling process. Um, if you turn your dot fit, dot predict, and like maybe your confusion matrix or your a AUC, ROC curves into a function that outputs everything you need all at once, that'd be really great. So you're not typing in dot fit, dot predict, dot confusion matrix, over and over again. Um, so that's something that I think is worth remembering. Let's see, functionalize modeling. There we go. Um, one more thing, does anyone know what a baseline, have we talked about baseline models before? Great, awesome. So baseline models, um, that's kind of where you can sort of decide whether you want to do your baseline model before or after doing something like smoked. So let's say you have like really awful um, class imbalance. Um, let's say you have like a 90 to 10 class imbalance. Your baseline model would be 90 and you ideally want to improve from 90. Um, so just keep in mind like those are the things to consider. Um, with baseline models, usually I would just pick like the, there's one, there's a, there's a classification model called dummy classifier um, on, it's part of scikit-learn. Um, I typically use that as my, um, as my baseline model, just because I think for the most part, it just picks like the most common class. Um, and so whatever that class balance is, if it's 50-50, you'll, your baseline is a 50%. And what's great about a baseline model is that in your evaluation of your project, and also in your resumes when you're interviewing in the future, you can say, I improved, this model from a baseline of like 50% improved it, I don't know, 80% to 
what's 80% over anyways to like 90, I think that's what the, the fraction is. Yeah. Improved it from 50% to 90%. And that's just like one, a great improvement to good to having your resume. Those are like the numbers that people are looking for. Um, so there's that baseline model. Um, let's see what else. Um, and yeah, um, I think it's also important to evaluate your models in different ways. So there are different, like, there are like your tree models, there are um, your probabilistic models, like naive Bayes. Um, there is your like logistic regression, which is a linear model. All of them will result in different like coefficients or feature importances. And I will say you probably won't need to go very in depth into evaluation for all the models that you run, but for your top like two or three, maybe take a deep dive and say like, all right, in this uh, logistic regression model, um, these coefficients are really high. So these, um, these were the features that are very predictive. And that not only you know, tells you more about your model, but also um, it kind of ties back into that like business purpose because you can sort of tell people, you can tell like whoever the stakeholders are, these are the predictive features. These are what you should maybe like keep an eye out for. Um, so what is it? What was I going to say? Yeah, interpret coefficients. Um, on a slight tangent, I don't know if anyone has ran logistic regression models for this project yet, but just keep in mind that logistic regression models, because they are linear models, you have some assumptions very similar to your, um, very similar to your reg uh, linear regression. So they're not exactly the same. I think I actually just Googled it today. There we go. Assumption of logistic regression. Um, I think the main one is that um, this one. You just have to make sure that they're not multi, there's no multicollinearity. I don't think you have the assumption of like your residuals being normal, um, but the main one I think is that there's little or no multicollinearity. So remember, if you're doing a logistic regression model, with all the other models, you can pretty much throw in all your features, but for logistic regression, remember you have to take out the ones that are uh, collinear. Um, so let me just make a note of that if you do. Logistic regression, take out collinear variables. variables. All right. I have a question, Yish. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned like doing SMOTE. So if you did have a class imbalance, and should you should you do SMOTE like before you do your dummy like baseline model or after? So you should definitely do, well, your baseline model should be before you smoke because it would okay. be, or it kind of depends like what you, yeah, I would say probably before you smoke. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because, because if you're, yeah, go ahead. Well, just because the dummy, then won't that mean that the dummy baseline model will like actually have better predictability than, than when you then rerun it after you smoke? It depends. So for example, if, let's say you have a 90-10 um, imbalance. If you uh -huh. use like a dummy classifier, your accuracy would be like 90. Yeah. Right. Um, if you smote um, and, and you run your dummy classifier after that, you have a 50% accuracy if you like balance out the classes. However, that's like not very indicative of, um, that's kind of like I'm creating my baseline on this fake data, if that makes sense. Mm. And that just like doesn't really make it's not like an ethical question, but it's more of like, it's not a valid, I mean, you could use that as like a base, like I guess a second baseline to like keep improving on. Or actually, if you if you have an imbalanced data set, you shouldn't really be looking at accuracy either. Actually, you should be looking more at a uh, recall. And okay. so just look at how those numbers are. Um, probably I would run, I would usually run a baseline before I do, um, the SMOT specifically, I would like one hot encode everything and I, I would do the baseline before doing SMOT just to see um, what it would do like in any vanilla model. But but yeah, that's how I would do it. Yeah, that's a great question and a good clarifying point. Um, all right, I think that's all I had to say about modeling, which kind of includes evaluation. Um, yeah. This is exactly what I just said. Accuracy is intuitive, but can be misleading, especially with class imbalances. So remember, 
um, that uh, if you have imbalance, you're usually looking for recall. Um, something that I actually find very helpful is in your evaluation, especially if you have a confusion, if you have a confusion matrix, um, actually contextualize what it means to have a false positive or a false negative. Um, actually put out in words. Like for example, if you're like doing like a spam or not spam data set, um, if, you're, if you're like classifying emails, um, a false positive would be saying that something is spam when it isn't and a false negative will be saying something is not spam when it is. And usually when you write those out, that's, there is one that you prefer. Um, so usually I feel like contextualizing and literally putting into words um, the false positives, yeah, false positives and false negatives. Um, one makes it easier for someone to interpret as they're going through your notebook, but also um, just informs you on whether, you know, you should be focusing, what, what metrics you should be focusing on. Um, in evaluation, something that, this is kind of like a, if you have time, um, take a look at your misclassified points. Um, I think that sometimes can say, um, let's say you have, I don't know, if it rains or won't rain, I can't think of any examples, any other better examples right now. But let's say you see like a really high cloud cover, but it actually didn't rain. And your model kind of like falsely predicted that it would rain, just because the like high cloud cover you would expect it to rain. Um, and something like that would also be kind of informative. Like, let's say um, a lot, maybe a lot of your misclassified points all have something in common. Maybe all the misclassified points have, um, I don't know, a feature like low temperatures. Um, that could be something kind of telling about your model and what things it is missing out on. Um, of course, it will very likely differ from model to model, but, but yeah, that I think is also an interesting thing to look at, especially um, for your presentation. It kind of depends because some people like to make their presentation slightly more technical. Um, if you can say, all right, this point, if I was to look at it, I would classify it wrong like the model as well, something like that. Um, that's usually like another thing that you can help, you know, back up your model. So take a look at misclassified. All right, um, this last section, um, deployment. Um, these are all things that you should take note of in your Jupyter Notebook. Why do you pick the questions that you did? Why are these important from a business perspective? Um, data cleaning options. I think it's very important, especially in your technical notebook to keep an ongoing narrative, especially in the data cleaning process. I know it's very easy just to like, okay, pd.fill and name, blah, blah, blah. Um, but just know that every function or method that you're doing is affecting your data in some way. So it's always good to be able to back up while you're doing what you're doing. Um, and if you can contextualize that, even better. So if you're deciding to fill something out with like, fill something up with median or mode versus uh, like a nearest neighbor's imputation, if anyone's heard of that. Um, yeah, ne nearest neighbor's imputation is cool. It's a different way of filling in null values with basically uh, the value of the points nearest to them. If that makes sense. But yeah, that's a cool one. There's a library that does it for you, so you don't have to do it by hand. Um, but yeah, these are, these are all really good questions to answer in your notebook. Um, why do you choose those visualizations? I wouldn't say why do you choose those visualizations, but more of like, you should, I guess, I guess actually no, that makes sense. Why do you choose those visualizations? Never mind, scratch that. Um, why do you pick those features as predictors? I think from your visualizations in your EDA process, you can kind of answer that as well. Results interpretation, how confident you are in the predictive quality of results. This you can back up by looking at misclassified points or looking at just your evaluation metrics. And what are some things that could cause, cause results to be wrong? Which again, misclassified points can really tell you things about that. Um, but yeah, I think that's pretty much it. These are like the main things that aren't in this explanation that I wanted to touch upon. Um, yeah, any, any questions, overall questions? Before you were mentioning, uh, how do you know when you're done? Oh my gosh, yeah. Thank you so much for reminding me that. Um, how do you know when you're done? I actually want to talk about that when I uh, brought baseline models. So um, 
one year of baseline model. So you can see like, all right, if I'm, if I tried like seven different models, I improve from the baseline to some point. Um, usually is when you see a plateau in your, um, in your whatever metric you're, you're choosing to use. Once you see a plateau, you're doing a bunch of grid search um, and plus with grid search, um, make sure that you are, you have um, exhausted, like, you know, the boundaries of your grids. So usually if I see like, all right, it's the best, let's say I'm testing maximum depth from three to 10. Um, and I see that it's best at 10. Maybe I also want to test 11, 12 to see that like, you know, maybe the deeper, the better uh, for max depth, um, things like that. Um, of course, as it starts to plateau, I, there's no like number that we're trying to achieve for sure. Um, but I would say like, if you see your results not going up more than like a percentage point, um, I say, I would say for like a two week project, um, that's good enough. But yeah, thanks for reminding me about that. Anything else? Cool. Awesome. Um, in the next couple of days, if any of you have questions that come up, um, as you're starting to work on the project, please feel free to slack me. Uh, I am a little light on students for the rest of this week. Um, so yeah, just let me know if you need anything. Um, yeah, I guess if there are no further questions, I will leave you all. Um, this is linked somewhere in Slack. I will get this recording up as soon as I can, and I'll link this as well when I post the recording. Um, in that case, again, feel free to Slack me whenever, um, and have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Bye.